Quantum mechanics includes all kinds of stuff, but probably the two most important things about it are one, things, uh, quantities that could be measured, angular momenta, projections of angular momenta, energy, are quantized, which means they come in discrete steps. Uh, they can't take on continuous values. Now, in our everyday life, the size of those steps are tiny compared to the sorts of energy and angular momentum we have, so we don't notice the steps. It's much like if you look at a very, very smooth ramp, and you look on the atomic scale, you'll notice it's bumpy because of the atoms. But on the macroscopic scale, it could be a mirror. It could be perfectly smooth. Perfect analogy, because it's actually the same scale. Uh, the other thing is the quantum uncertainty, which shows up sort of in two ways, uh, or two, really it's one way that's related. And that is sometimes if you know one thing, you can't know another. And that's why with angular momentum and quantum, classically with angular momentum, you can know all three components, x, y, and z, of the angular momentum vector. Or equivalently, if you knew the total and you knew two projections, so if you knew the total and you knew the x and the y, you could calculate the z, right? The, the z component is going to be the square root of the total, the magnitude squared, minus lx squared minus ly squared, take a square root. You now have lz. Quantum mechanically, you can only know two of those three numbers at once. So you could know, and you can't know two different projections at once. You can know the total and one projection. Um, if you know one projection, the others are uncertain. Anything within what's possible, it could be any of them. Or you could have some joint uncertainty. Also the classic Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So that's, those are the two main observations of quantum mechanics. Out of all of this, particularly out of the angular momentum considerations, comes the uh, comes the, the periodic table, the entire structure of the periodic table. So the first question, without looking at a periodic table or other reference, write down the electronic configuration of titanium, atomic number 22. So that means there's 22 protons. So if titanium is neutral and it's in its ground state, we can use this periodic table construction kit thing, which looks like this where this is um, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. These are s orbitals, so that's l equals 0. This is l equals 0. This is l equals 1, p orbitals. l equals 0, l equals 1, l equals 2. Ordered vertically in increasing energy. So the 1s state is the lowest energy. The 2s state next, the 2p state next, the 3s state next, the 3p state next. And here's where it gets a little weird. The 4s state is actually lower energy than the 3d state. L equals 1. Um, yes. And, well, fine. That's going to be enough. And then you know in the s, there's only one state. There's only one orbital there, but you can put two electrons in it because electrons have spin one half. Each electron could either be up or down. So you can only put one electron in a state. That means you can put two in an orbital because there's two different spin states to distinguish them. So we have two, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's how many you can fit in an L equals one state or a P orbital. That's because L could be any of one, zero, or negative one. Sorry, not L, but M sub L, the Z component could be any of one, zero, or negative one. So there's three orbitals now, and then you can put two electrons per orbital. And then here we have two. Then you can put 10, because there's two, one, zero, negative one, negative two are the possible m values, right? So remember the m sub l, the z component, is anywhere from negative l up to positive l. So if l is two, that means negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. That's five possibilities. Two electrons per orbital because of the electron spin, there's 10. 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, 10. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And I'm pretty sure at this point I've got enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start filling in electrons. Um, you can just X them off if you like. Sometimes people like to draw the up and the down to indicate that they're opposite spins. Um, this actually gives more information but it then adds more possibilities for getting it slightly off from reality. So I'm just going to start Xing them off because that's really all I asked for. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We're up to 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So that's 22 electrons that filled up. So now I know the electronic configuration. And now here's the notation for this. You start with N, 1, 
Then you write down S, P, or D for the type of orbital, and you put superscript the number of electrons in it. I know that looks like 1s squared, but this is not what that is. This is atomic notation. Then we have 2s squared, 2p6, because there's 6 there, 3s2, 3p6. And now, here's the way you really write it, is 3d2, 4s2, although it might make more sense to write this as 4s2, 3d2, because um, this is lower energy than that. It depends if you want to order it by n or by that. So that's my prediction. So now what I'm going to do is go look at the periodic table. I have one right here. So atomic number 22, titanium, and it tells me, here's what it says. Um, it says AR, what? Already clearly I'm wrong, 3d2, 4s2. What's AR? Well, the way this periodic table does it, if there's something in brackets, it's referring back to the electronic configuration of a noble gas. So the idea is that all atoms have inside the electronic configuration of a noble gas plus additional electrons outside that. So when I go look at argon, it says, here's what argon says. So basically, I substitute for argon and I get neon. It's like, oh dear. Neon, um, and then my brain just suddenly died on me. Uh, 3s2, 3b6. And then I have the 3D2, 4S2 that I just copied down from there. And then finally, if you look at neon, neon says 1S2, 2S2, 2P6. And then you have all the rest of these. Right, so this is what I get looking at the periodic table and expanding these out. Here's what I got thinking about the periodic table construction kit. And hey, it just works. So you don't have to, I mean, you will discover in the homework that occasionally the construction kit gets the last electron wrong. And that's because this is a simplified version and all of the interactions, I mean there's 23 particles interacting here. The nucleus, which I'm counting as one particle, even though it has protons and neutrons in it, but let's call that one particle, plus 22 electrons. That's a complicated system with lots of interactions and as a result the energy is slightly different from what it would be just simply and the orbitals are all slightly modified. Uh, but it turns out that they usually don't get modified very much so that this construction kit actually works very well. And you just start, you figure out what orbitals are available, how are they ordered in energy in the ground state, just start filling them up. And then you can figure out where all the electrons are going to go just by filling them up from the bottom. And you get exactly what you see on the periodic table. All right, more of that in the homework that you will do. First problem. Second problem. What? Part A. What is the longest wavelength that a hydrogen atom in its ground state will absorb? So we need to think about the potential well, can you see that? I hope that's not too bright, of the hydrogen. Right, there's the ground state, there's the first excited state, there's the second excited state, there's the third excited state, there's the fourth excited state, and they get ever and ever and ever closer together as you get towards the top, and that's going to be plenty there. Okay, so this is in hydrogen, we say the ground state, we, can, we give that the atomic number n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, 4, 5, okay, those are the n's. And the energy of the nth state is equal to 13, well, it's equal to the Rydberg divided by n squared, and I'll put in the number for the Rydberg later. Okay, so if you think about, if you have an electron sitting here in the ground state, that's hydrogen in the ground state, that means the electron's in this 1s orbital, if a photon comes in, if the photon has just the right amount of energy, and it has to have just the right amount of energy, it'll get absorbed by the hydrogen. It could jump to the here, it could jump to here, it could jump to here, or if there's plenty of energy, it could actually kick the electron out altogether. Well, so the lowest energy is this, because any other transition will be a higher energy than the n equals 2 to n equals 1 transition. That's the lowest energy it could absorb, and remember the lowest energy photon is the longest wavelength photon. So what I asked was for the longest wavelength. So we know that the lowest possible energy of a photon that could be absorbed is going to be the delta E, and this En should have had a negative sign on it, right, because we define zero energy if the electron's free, otherwise it's bound as a negative energy. So delta E is going to be minus Ry over 2 squared minus minus Ry over 1 squared. So I'm taking the energy of the second level minus the energy of the first level. That's the difference between here and here, right? So that's minus Ry over 4 plus Ry, which is equal to 
three r y over four because that's four r y over four and four minus one is three. So that's the amount of energy, and that is going to equal the energy of the photon, which is h c over lambda of the longest wavelength photon that could be absorbed. Okay, so now I just need to solve this for lambda. So I get lambda is equal to three r y over 4hc, and now I can just put the numbers in. Now, I'm gonna tell you a, a shortcut here. I could look up h and c, I've given to them to you before, but it turns out that h times c is equal to 1240 electron volts times nanometers. That's if you just put in h and c in the usual units, and you do a unit conversion to this, that's what you get. This is convenient because it's in electron volts, which is what we tend to use for atoms, and nanometers, which we often use for wavelengths. If you want more digits, and you should, it's 1239.84. Really, it's 1239.84 EV nanometers. So this is three sig figs. If your answer only needs to be good to two sig figs, this is good enough. If you want more, put that in. So this gives me everything I need to do. So H is equal to three. The Rydberg is 13.6 EV divided by four, and I'll go ahead and put in 1239.84. Um, I lied to you. This is EV, no, this is EV times nanometers. Uh, what have I done wrong? Huh, I did my algebra wrong. You're over there laughing at me because I've done this, I made the same exact mistake once before. Right, if I multiply both sides by lambda and I divide both sides by three, I'll write over four, I get lambda is equal to four HC over 3ry, 3 Rydbergs, three right? 3ry, you would divide by, lambda you would multiply by. Sorry about that, same algebra mistake that I did once before. I gotta stop doing this, it's embarrassing. But, I caught it by looking at my units. My units weren't gonna work right. So, four times hc divided by three times the Rydberg, 13.6 eV. And so now I can stick that in my calculator. And the result I get is 122 nanometers. That is the longest wavelength that will be absorbed by hydrogen in the ground state. That's an ultraviolet photon. So if hydrogen's in the ground state, you need at least an ultraviolet photon to do anything. Any shorter wavelength would be less energy and there's no state for hydrogen to go to, so it can't absorb it. So um, this is the longest wavelength. Others will be even shorter than that. All right, that's part A. Part B. The Balmer series of, uh, is a set of emission lines. So we say line, it's jargon for emission wavelengths. Emission lines observed from hydrogen. It doesn't represent all the lines observed, but it does represent the most prominent ones seen at optical wavelengths. It is the series of transitions from higher levels to the N equals two level of hydrogen. What are the wavelengths in optical wavelength range 400 to 700 nanometers and sketch it. So, okay, so let's, um, I'm gonna keep that picture here. I'm going to keep this picture. I'm going to keep, not that, and, oh, I should have kept my, what was it, 12, 39.84, because I'll use that again. Okay, so here's the deal. I want to go now, in fact, let's get a different picture here. I want to get the tra this transition from n equals 3 to 2, n equals 4 to 2, n equals 5 to 2, so on and so forth. So the delta E's I'm going to need, there's going to be a delta E 3 to 2. So that will be Ry over 3 squared, negative Ry over 3 squared, plus, which is minus minus, Ry over 2 squared. I need a delta E 4 to 2 is minus Ry over 4 squared, plus Ry over 2 squared. I'm going to need delta E 5 to 2, and I might need delta E 6 to 2, but let's do these three first and see where we are minus ry over five squared plus ry over two squared. All right, so that's going to equal three squared is nine, two squared is four, so minus ry over nine plus ry over four, so we have to put them over a common denominator. That's going to be minus four ry plus nine ry over 36 for the common denominator, so I multiply this by four over four multiply this by 980 over 9, and I get this. So that's 536 Ry. Okay, good. This one is minus Ry over 16 plus Ry over 4. That's a much easier common denominator, right? Because that's minus Ry plus 4 Ry all over 16, because I multiply this by 4 over 4, and I get that. 
So that's equal to 3 sixteenths Ry. And finally, we for this one, and of course we may have to do the 6 as well. So it's minus Ry over 25 plus Ry over 4. And now you're thinking, can't I just do this in my calculator? Yeah, you can, but let's do it. So I'm going to multiply this by 4. We get minus 4 Ry plus 25 Ry over 100. So that's equal to 21 one hundredths of an Ry. And then we have, I had this before, is that HC over lambda has to equal delta E. So lambda is going to equal, and I'm going to do it right this time, um, HC over delta E. So lambda from 3 to 2 is equal to HC times 3 to 2. I have to divide by delta E. So I need to put a 3 up here over 5 Ry. So that's going to be 1239.84 EV nanometers divided by 5 times 13.6 EV. That's good. Lambda 4 to 2 is equal to HC. Now I have a 16 thirds. So 16 over three, nine, five. Yes, I'm good, fine. Y is equal to, I don't want to forget this three here, 16 times 1239.84 EV nanometers over three times 13.6 EV. And lambda five to two is equal to uh, 100 HC over 21 Ry is equal to 100 times 1239.84 EV times nanometers divided by 21 times 13.6 EV. So now I can put all of those in my calculator all at once. All right, I hope you were laughing at me. There was a copying error. 9 minus 4 is 5. 36 is not the same as 3. This should have been 36. So this should have been 36. So that's fine. So here's what I get. I put it all in my calculator. I get lambda 3 to 2 is equal to 656 nanometers. We actually have a name for that wavelength. It's H alpha because it's the brightest line seen in the obstacle from hydrogen. Lambda 4 to 2 is equal to 486 nanometers. Guess what we call that? Yes, H beta. And lambda 5 to 2, lambda 5 to 2 is 434 nanometers. And if you followed this same procedure, this is H gamma, if you follow the same procedure, H6 to 2 is equal to 410 nanometers, and then you really are at the lowest one that you can see, H delta. Um, yes, I think I rounded all those right. So these are the optical lines that you can see from hydrogen, and they correspond to these transitions down to the level 2, which means to even get these lines at all, you have to somehow get electrons up above that. We see this in astronomy all the time. On the ground, you have to do stuff like put it in a vapor tube. You don't, won't usually just see it in nature. There's a problem later where we'll do that. So if I plot um, brightness versus wavelength, right? So let's go up. So it's a one, two, three, four, five, six. Here's 700 nanometers, right? One, two, three, here's 400 nanometers. And if I try and plot this spectrum, I know that there's got to be a very bright line at 656, so 4, 5, 656. There'll be a bright peak there. Then I'm being anal and I want a blue pen. Oh yeah, my blue pen died. I remember that now. How sad. Here, I'll use this neon cyan one. Um, 486, that'll be like here. Then we have another one at 434, which is like here. And another one at 410, which is like that. So that those are the light... This is what you would see if you plotted brightness versus wavelength. You will actually see this in lab next week. All right, that is the second problem. Third problem. In a 1 over r potential, including the potential energy of an electron orbiting atomic nucleus and the potential of a planet orbiting a star, so just to remind you of that, the potential energy of the Earth-Sun system is minus g, mass of the sun, mass of the earth, divided by r, where r is the distance from the earth to the sun. So that's the potential energy of the earth-sun system. It's not r squared, that's the force. And then, the, so this is the earth-sun, whereas this, that's a symbol that means earth, that means sun. 
the potential energy of an electron and a hydrogen atom is minus Ke squared over R. And it's E squared because E is the charge on the proton and the charge on the electron. It's just one of them's negative. That's where that comes from. There's always a negative with gravity. Right, okay. That's what I mean when I say it's a 1 over R. These are all constants. I mean, they're different for different objects, but this is the thing that can vary within the one system. So they're 1 over R potentials. A classical circular orbit, so we're not talking a quantum orbit, which we know aren't really circles. A classical cir circular orbit has total energy equal to half its potential energy. So what I'm saying is that E tote is equal to 1 half PE. And of course, Ke, E tote is Ke plus PE has to equal 1 half PE. Or, um, if I subtract Ke or PE from both sides, Ke is equal to minus 1 half PE. And that's good because the potential energy is negative, <laughs> the kinetic energy had better be positive. So, this, this is the same thing as this, just from these two lines of algebra. And the first thing I want to do is verify this is true for the Earth in its orbit. Right. Well, I'm, I'm going to do it slightly differently. I'm going to divide both sides by PE, and I'm going to make sure that KE divided by PE is equal to minus one half. And the reason I'm going to do that is that if you look, I give you the mass of the sun. I give you the distance. Um, I didn't give you gravitational constant, but G is equal to 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11th. We still have that from the last problem. Meters cubed per kilogram second squared. All right, that's big G. You can look that up. You could look all these up. And I give you the speed, but I didn't give you the mass of the Earth. So now you'd be tempted, oh, I'll look up the mass of the Earth. But remember, I always like to try and do as much as I can symbolically before I'm done. So the kinetic energy of the Earth, and we're going to check, is that true? So the kinetic energy of the Earth is one half mass of the Earth, velocity of the Earth squared, divided by, so I have fractions of fractions here, minus g mass of the sun mass of the earth over r squared. I'm going to calculate that and see. I should get negative 1 half if all works. And this is why you don't need the mass of the earth. Notice it cancels out. So if I turn this into one fraction, I have v squared r squared. I can move the negative up. Right, so r squared was in the denominator of the denominator. So I can move it up like that. It's like multiplying the top and bottom by r squared. Divided by 2 g m sun. And now we now it's at the point where we actually have all the numbers. We can plug it in. So it's 29.8 times 10 to the 3 meters per second squared. R, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, is 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters squared divided by um, 2 times G. We have a problem. Ah, this shouldn't have been r squared, sorry. I did the force. I, that's the, what the potential is, right? So that r is not squared. Um, and then the bottom, we have 2 times 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11th meters cubed per kilogram second squared times the mass of the sun, which is 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. So if we check units, that was a kilogram there. Kilogram cancels kilogram. Second squared cancels the second squared there. And I have meters squared times meters is meters cubed. We'll cancel that meters. Yeah, so I get a unitless thing. And I'm going to put these numbers in my calculator and see what I get. And I get 0 0.500. How many sig figs do I have? Three, because I have three in that number. Uh, and that's good, because to four sig figs, it wasn't right. So I got 0 0.5001, but my number is only good to three sig figs. So yes, it works. Oh, and negative. Forgot the negative sign here. So I get negative one half. Yay, it works for the Earth. That was part A. Just verifying. I'm asserting this is always true for a circular orbit. And hey, it seems to work for the Earth. So good. So this is a thing that's true. Now comes the conceptually difficult part of this question. And that is where we're going to try and use this and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is that delta x, delta px, has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2, where h bar is equal to 1.054, or is it 055? I always forget the fourth digit. I'm going to say 4 for now, and I'll tell you later if I got it wrong. Times 10 to the minus 34 uh, joules times seconds. That's what h bar is. 
how the heck do we use this? So let's think about the ground state of the hydrogen atom. We know we have an electron here, and it's in some sort of cloud, and then the size of this cloud will have some radius to it. <laughs> right? Well, and, and the cloud doesn't have an edge, right? It actually kind of keeps going on forever. Right? When we plotted it uh, in class, we had a sort of a fuzzy blob here uh, with the uh, with a thicker at the center, uh, brighter is what it looked like on the fuzzy blob, and dimmer further out. And so you can see that the typical radius looks like something like half an angstrom. That's about what we should get. Uh, but it keeps going all the way. So we're looking for this typical radius. All right, so here's the thing. What that means is this typical radius here, if it's the ground state, it's as close as it can get, right? It doesn't get any closer. Um, you know that the, the bigger orbitals are further out. So this is as close as it can get for the ground state. And if the Heisenberg uncertainty is what says it can't get any closer, then this will sort of be the smallest. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is what's going to limit us on that. And now, why do we use this circular orbit thing? Well, in classical orbits, a circular orbit is the lowest energy orbit of a given size. So you can have, like, we'll go back to the sun and the earth, you can have, like, comets or an elliptical orbits like this. And if you take this, what we call the major axis, and divide it by two, that's what we call the semi-major axis. If you have a circular orbit whose radius is the same as this semi-major axis, right, if this length is the same as this, you would say they're the same distance from the sun. What? what? You're saying, well, so, okay, here's the thing. This is always different distances of the sun, sometimes farther, sometimes closer, but the size of the orbit, what we really mean is the semi-major axis, which for a circle is the radius. It turns out for a given size of orbit, a given semi-major axis, the circle is the lowest energy orbit. So if we're thinking about the ground state for hydrogen, we'll think, well, it's kind of like a circle. Now, you know it's not really a circle, so we don't, shouldn't expect to get exactly the right answer here. But we should expect to get something of the right order of magnitude. So what we're doing is kind of a classical quantum physics analog thing, saying if we just think about the scaling of it, can we make it kind of work? So if this is true, then the Ke over the Pe ought to equal minus one half. So what does that tell us about R and P? Well, okay, so the kinetic energy has to be something like one half m of the electron, velocity of the electron squared. And then the potential energy has to be something like uh, minus that Coulomb constant times the charge in the electron squared divided by R. Okay, well, what can we do with this? All right, we're going to then want to use this. And what I want to assert is that What's the, I'm going to use the velocity as the same as the uncertainty in the velocity. And why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. Because if a car is going, say, 60 miles per hour, but your speedometer only gives you plus or minus one mile per hour, the uncertainty would be one mile per hour out of 60 miles per hour. Well, here's the thing, is that if you have an electron in its ground state, it's equally likely to be in all directions. It has no angular momentum. And if it has no angular momentum, what that means is that it's not really going in a circle. You'd actually expect its average, average velocity to be zero, because that's how you get a big symmetric cloud with no net momentum in any direction and no net angular momentum. It has all of that. The average speed should be zero. So then the typical speed inside the uncertainty would be about delta v, just like the average position is the center, but the uncertainty of the position is going to be the radius of this orbit. So I'm going to say if it's at a typical radius within the uncertainties, how close it can get before you can't, it can't be more precise, then the velocity is going to have to sort of match with that. And then we want these to match as well. So what I'm going to say is that delta x is approximately equal to the size of this orbit, and delta px is approximately equal to the mass of the electron times the speed that would go with a circular orbit, which is the lowest energy orbit classically, right? So we're, we're, we're making analogs. We're saying classically, if it were a circular orbit, the speed and the radius would be related by this equal to minus one half. Well, and then here's how, if the average speed has to be, or average velocity has to be zero, there's some uncertainty in that. Let's say, let's say that it kind of matches that classical analog. All right, so if these has to be true, then we know that um, Me times V times R um, 
has to be greater than or equal to this, so the smallest it can be is h bar over 2. Or what I'm going to do is we'll say that v has to equal h bar over 2 rme. All right. And now I'm going to substitute that back here. Um, so first of all, I'm going to do one line of simplification. me v squared r over, with a negative sign, over um, 2ke squared. And now I'm going to substitute this in for v, so we get minus me h bar squared r divided by, and then I have a 2 rme, so I have a 2, sorry, it would become 4 times that 2 becomes an 8, because we're squaring v, so this 2 squared becomes 4 times that 2 is 8, me squared r squared, so I wrote r times me is me times r, times ke squared, and now we can cancel stuff out, r squared and r partially cancel, me squared and me kind of cancel, this whole thing has to equal minus 1 half, or if we solve, I now hereby run out of board space, so I'm just going to, since I run out of board space, I'm going to do it over here, or I'll get rid of this top stuff, which we don't need anymore. Why didn't I use an eraser? If we solve this for r, I'm just going to write it again because it's kind of a mess over there. I have minus h bar squared over 8 m e uh, k e squared r is equal to minus 1 half. Or r is equal to um, 2 over 4. 2 over 8 is 1 fourth. h bar squared over 4 m e k e squared r and now we can put these numbers in, 1.054 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds is kilogram meter squared per second squared divided by 4 times the mass of the, 11, of the electron is 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms times the Coulomb constant K, I don't have that in my head, I'm going to go look it up, Coulomb constant K, 8 Nine eight seven six times ten to the ninth, and then the units on that are. Let's see, it's got to be newton meter squared per coulomb squared, and I'm going to rewrite newton as a kilogram meter per second squared, so it becomes kilogram meter cubed per second squared coulomb squared. What else do I have on the bottom? I have me, I have k, I have to have e squared. The charge on the electron is one point six oh two times ten to the minus nineteenth. Coulombs squared, and finally, I shouldn't have this r because uh, no, it was there, but then I moved the r over here, so I shouldn't have the r there. So that's all of this is equal to r. So now I have enough to put into my calculator. Let's check the units. Coulomb squared on the top of the denominator. Coulomb squared, good. Kilograms squared. Kilograms times kilograms. Yes. I have um, a problem because, oh no, I don't have a problem, I have meters squared squared, which is meters to the fourth divided by meters cubed, that's going to leave me with a meters on top, excellent. I have second squared and second squared, so I'm left with just meters, so that's what we expect. So let's go ahead and do this. We get a result of 1.3 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, right? So if you want that in units that's closer to what we usually use for atoms, Let's go to nanometers, so 10 to the minus 11th, we have to multiply by uh, 100 to get this 10 out of sign, minus 9, so we also have to divide by 100, so you go 0.01, really we only have one sig fig here, but I'm going to leave it like this, 0.013 nanometers, or we could also write this as 0.13 angstroms, which is a tenth of a meter, just another, sorry, not a tenth, a 10 to the minus tenth of a meter, another unit we use. Okay, so that sounds a little small looking at the plot we had earlier, but okay, let's go with it. The real goal was to calculate the energy. So we said so we calculated the radius, or what I say, calculate the size. Oh, yeah, so we're done. Hey, it looks kind of small. I'm going to do another thing with this, though, that I didn't say in the problem. Now, let's calculate the energy, right? The energy of the ground state, which should be the potential energy over 2 under this kind of fuzzy, hey, what if this thing from classical mechanics applies to quantum mechanics somehow, assumption works. We can put that in. So let's put in um, uh, minus k e squared over 2 r. If you put this r in, you get 
fi minus 54 EV, which interestingly is minus 4 times 13.6 EV. Uh, it, it actually comes out really close to that. Okay, so let's step back and review what we did. We started by looking at classical physics and saying, hey, we have this result that the total energy is half the potential energy for a circular orbit. Circular orbits are orbits with maximum symmetry that you can get. Hey, the hydrogen ground state orbital isn't a circle at all, but it's the maximum symmetry or orbit. Let's kind of, let's say, what if this were true? Now, really, neither the KE nor the PE are definite, but let's say, oh, what if we kind of use that consideration and then use the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to say that in the lowest energy state, as close as this electron can get um, to this to this guy here, well, okay, that's going to say we have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This will be the R. The distance is about the size of the cloud. And then if you say that the velocity is, is unknown, but it's averaged around zero, then the typical velocity will be about this, because the uncertainty is going to be plus or minus that in any component. And hey, let's set these equal to h bar over 2. Um, and it'll be all exciting. And once we've done that, these two to h bar over 2, if we put it into this kinetic energy, potential energy relationship, we can get a predicted r, which is that, which is a little small which gives us a predicted ground state energy, which is that which is a little small, but notice we only are off by that factor there. So where might that have come from? If instead of two I had just put h bar here, I would have gotten it almost exactly right. But really what's important is that we got it to order of magnitude. You might say, factor of four off, that's way off, but it's not. Remember, 13.6 EV is something like two times 10 to the minus 18 joules, and we predicted something that was 10 to the minus 18 joules. We got it to order of magnitude. It's not 10 to the minus 24 joules. It's not 10 to the minus 10 joules. We got, the, hey, it's right about the approximate factor of 10 joules, just from these kind of really hand wavy considerations. So what this really shows is that the ground state of hydrogen is consistent with this Heisenberg uncertainty principle we talked about. They're not just two separate things. Oh, quantum gives us this and it gives us this. They all kind of hang together. The reason the electron cloud is fuzzed out it's because there's just a probability of where it is. There's some uncertainty in the position. And likewise, there's an uncertainty in the momentum. And if we say that those two things are related like circular orbits for classical stuff, then man, it works out about right. Anyway, that's the third problem. In the fourth problem, I start by telling you that the typical kinetic energy of a particle in a gas at temperature T is approximately kT. So what I'm saying is that kinetic energy is approximately equal to K times T, where T is the temperature. K is Boltzmann's constant, which I give you is 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. So this, that's Kelvin temperature thing. So this Boltzmann's constant is a thing that um, comes up a lot if you do statistical mechanics or if you do thermodynamics from a physicist's point of view. I don't know if it showed up when you took chemistry, but when a physicist writes down the ideal gas law, it'll have this constant in it instead of the ideal gas constant, just because of how we like to think about things. So good, okay. And here's what I'm gonna say. It actually turns out that it might be slightly better to say three halves kT. They're different by obviously 50%, right? Three halves versus one, one and a half versus one, one's 50% bigger. But really, I'm, again, I'm only doing this to kind of roughly order of magnitude to make things are right. But I'll go ahead and use three halves kT, turns out is a good approximation. There's details that goes into it. But that's actually a really good approximation. Good. At room temperature, in what level n must the electron in a hydrogen atom be for it to be easily ionized by collisions with other atoms? So what you have is, here's a hydrogen. Here's the ground state. Here's the first excited state. Here's the second excited state. Here's the third excited state. Here's the fourth excited state. Fifth excited state, so on and so forth. And the idea is, is that you have an electron that's not in the ground state for whatever reason, I'm not specifying how this happened, I'm just saying somehow you have an electron in the other state, and what you want to do is give it enough energy to get it up to zero energy, because when it's at zero energy, that is just barely a free electron. It would have zero kinetic energy. If you got it above zero, then the additional energy would be kinetic energy. So we want this delta E, the energy to go from the state the electron was in up to zero, is going to be zero minus 
the Rydberg over n squared, where n is whatever level it started in. And what I'm saying is if, where, all right, so question, when you add energy to something, where does it come from? In this problem, I'm saying for it to be ionized, ionized means knock the electron off, by collisions with other atoms, which means, oh, two of these atoms collided with each other, and all of the energy from this atom, see, they came together and they stopped. Really, there's two of them moving, right? But let's not worry about momentum for a moment. Suppose this guy's at rest. This guy comes in and stops. Oh, it bothers me to violate conservation momentum like that. But we're doing orders of magnitude, just deal with it. And all of that kinetic energy goes into exciting the electron. So this delta E, which is minus Ry, sorry, this is zero minus minus, that's so plus Ry over n squared. Well, that's 3 halves kT, because that's how much kinetic energy there is. And so we're saying for typical room temperatures, what is room temperature? Well, room temperature, I don't know, let's call it uh, 25, oh, let's, let's be spastic, and we'll call it 27 degrees centigrade. It's a little bit warm for room temperature, that's probably something like, um, uh, it's like 78 degrees if I did that right Fahrenheit. Okay, it's kind of warm, but the reason I did that is because that's exactly 300 Kelvin. Because you have to add 273 to Celsius, and that just makes the number easier to deal with. So 300 Kelvin is what I'm calling room temperature. And I want to find what N must it be in so that this amount of energy is right. It's going to turn out N equals 1 won't do it. So what I can just say is, well, so N squared has to equal... 2Ry over 3kT. So what I did is I multiplied both sides by n squared, divided both sides by 3 house kT, I get this. Or n has to equal 2Ry divided by 3kT. So I can put these numbers in. So that's 2 times 13.6 eV divided by 3 times 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin times 300 Kelvin. And now if I look at the units here, Kelvin cancels Kelvin, I have EV over joules. Oh, it didn't go away, and N should just be a number. Well, I need to put in a unit conversion, right? EV is an, is an energy unit, joules is an energy unit, I need to make them the same. So I'm just gonna put in my energy conversion, which is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th joules per EV, right? That's my energy, or my unit conversion. So now the EVs cancel, the joules cancel, I get something unitless that I can put in my calculator. What I get <clears throat> to two significant figures, which is maybe too many here, N has to equal 350. So that's one of these levels that's barely below the top, right? There's many, many levels that get all squeezed in here. So this is how excited hydrogen would have to be if just routine collisions with other air molecules could knock the electrons off. This is why if you just release some hydrogen gas into the air, you don't get a plasma. It stays atomic because the collisions with the air molecules don't have enough energy to ionize it because most hydrogen's in the ground state, not in the 350th state. That's the first part. Second part, what would the temperature of a gas be for collisions to regularly ionize a hydrogen atom? So we're turning the question around. Now, let's suppose it really is in the ground state, so n equals 1. What temperature do we need to ionize it? So, all right, so we want to say, what temperature do we need? So that's just going to say 2 thirds Ry over K, because N equals 1. Then T has to be 2 thirds Ry over K. So that's basically the same thing, 2 thirds times 13.6 EV times 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th joules per EV unit conversion. All right, divided by K, 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. So EV cancels EV, joules cancels joules, and I have one over one over Kelvin, so I'm gonna get something in Kelvin, calculator, and I get 100,000 Kelvin. Think about that for a moment. For hydrogen to be routinely ionized by collisions, meaning atoms, when atoms run into each other, they have enough kinetic energy that that energy, if given to the electron, could make the electron go from the ground state to free, right? So that this delta E of 13.6 EV for the Ke to be enough to ionize it, to have that much energy, you have to be at 100,000 Kelvin. Even the surface of the sun isn't that hot. Uh, however, in the interior of the sun, lots of places are hotter that are even hotter. The mi middle of the sun's like 15 million Kelvin, if I remember correctly. So lots of ionized hydrogen inside the sun. But yeah, so it's gotta be really hot. 
And then finally, what must the temperature of a gas be for collisions to regularly excite a hydrogen from the n equals 1 to n equals 2 state? So now this is the delta E we want. So this delta E is the energy of the n equals 2 state, which is minus Ry over 2 squared, minus the energy of the n equals 1 state, which is minus Ry over 1. So that this minus minus becomes a plus. Uh, so this is 4 over 4 minus 1, so this is going to be 3 fourths Ry. And now that has to equal um, 3 halves kT. All right, so we can divide both sides by 3, multiply both sides by 2, and I get Ry over 2k, if I did that right, I think I did, Ry over 2k has to equal t. Okay, so let me um, put that in my calculator. And to 1 sig fig, I get 79,000 Kelvin. To 1 sig, I get 80,000 Kelvin. What this tells you is that if you have a bunch of hydrogen gas sitting around, right, because you have a, a big tank of hydrogen, psh, you release it for a little while, because or you fill up a balloon with hydrogen because you're going to light it and watch it explode. Yes. Or you've got the Hindenburg and you fill it up with hydrogen and then, oh, the humanity. Whatever. You have a bunch of hydrogen gas around. You can be sure that the vast majority of those atoms are sitting in the ground state. They're sitting in the ground state because why wouldn't they? Because if they were in a higher state, they would jump back down and emit photons. To get bumped to a higher state, they have to get energy. What's the main place hydrogen gets energy? Well, light could shine on it. But we've talked before about the photons necessary, and there's very few ultraviolet photons um, inside the Hindenburg's gas bag. So that won't happen. And then colliding with each other, you have to be at 80,000 Kelvin before you have about the right amount of energy to do this a lot. And since we're way less than 80,000 Kelvin, this basically never happens. So all the hydrogen is in its electronic ground state. Um, it has kinetic energy, right, like that. So it's moving around. It's not really like zero temperature. But from the point of view of the electronic ground state, 300 Kelvin might as well be absolute zero. Okay, that's it for this week.